I think we are. All right. We'll call the Land Use Committee meeting to order this Tuesday, December 12th at 7.30 a.m. And the first discussion item is KBA's request for the Land Use Committee. And I've, got, I've scheduled... So I don't believe we want to do what their desire is. Their desire is to... And they've approached all of the cities... Um, to create this committee of people from the development community that, that meets with myself and, and Nick and council members to um, help draft our code whenever we, we do anything related to land use. And I'm not, I don't know, Scott can probably speak to how, if it works well at the county or not, but my thoughts were, and, 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 and this probably will need to get tabled until next year, because this, this committee, dynamics of this committee are probably going to, ch could change. Uh, and uh, I would want the, hopefully want the, whoever's on this committee next year to be supportive of, the, of whatever it is that is developed. But the Economic Development Committee versus, versus what they're asking for, I think what could work is the Economic Development Committee has reached out to the Merchants Association and any time they just notify them of the meeting and any issues so they, they carve out the first part of the meeting for issues related that, that would affect them. Many times they stay for the whole meeting and the folks get up and leave. So they invite them to the table um, for things that are impacting them but it, it's. I don't think it's anywhere near what what they're asking for, and you know, it's really there. It's your guys's committee. We'll do whatever you guys want, but I'm a little nervous about you know injecting you know making them really part of our to you know it, the fabric. Yeah, yeah. I'd love to hear from Scott on that, but the question I would have with, with you know, the answer of it is, it just it just feels like we're adding another layer. Because we do have land use, which is a form to be able to address this stuff and invite people in, and we have a planning commission. Yeah, and that's what I'm. What I'm. If we do something along these lines, I'm suggesting that they become part of. I, I don't. We don't want to staff another committee meeting, mm -hmm. so it would be inviting them to the land use committee, and it, and when there's issues that directly affect this association, you put them the first couple of items on the agenda so that. You know, so they're involved in the process earlier. Sure. Is is what I'm, I, you know, would suggest. You could say I want any part of it, but it is a public meeting. They can come and attend, and they're probably going to sit, you know, right around the table anyway, uh, if 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 they really wanted to, because this is a public meeting. So, can you you want to speak at all to what happens at the county and whether it works or? Well, so originally. The uh, Kitsap County has what they call the Department of Advisory Group, the DAG. And the DAG was created in 2007 as a result of um, basically 13 directors in almost as many years with DCD. So that's about the time I came on board and they hired a consultant after they had just let go of Cindy Baker at the time. And um, they did, um, well, Commissioner Steve Bowers and um, Casey Jones did a report basically found that you know, DCD's business practices, um, amongst a bunch of other things, its culture, etc., needed to be looked at. And so the department advisory group was really put together to advise on its business practices and nothing more. <laughs> but um, soon after Larry Keaton came on board, that ship began to turn around and um, this group started looking for more to do. I mean, essentially their mission was done. DCD was, was moving along pretty well. Um, and so their role morphed into one of, well, let's talk about everything DCD is doing, particularly code. And so they, including very recently, are kind of looking for a mission. Um, and some of those meetings devolve into project level questions, which really is not appropriate, and code, which also is not really appropriate given the mission of that group. So it's... it's um, it's kind of a questionable model, I think, for DCD, anyways, as it was originally invented. Um, that's that's how it works with DCD. Um, the group is 
I think there's originally there was close to 30 members. Um, a couple at one point there were three past directors <coughs> involved in that: Jim Tracy, Bill Palmer, and Ron Perkowitz. Um, but anyways, uh, you know, I don't know about having them um, come and, and sit at the table as part of a regular advisory group. I'm I'm a little conflicted on it. Okay, and and I have a meeting with them next uh, when or next Tuesday, 4 p.m. Um, to sit down. So Nick and I agreed to meet with them, and I just like to get a little bit of feedback. Of what, I mean, more than anything, I can tell them, hey, we're, and I, that's what I wrote to Teresa already in an email, who's now not there any longer. Um, but, I, you know, whatever happens here, I think it needs to happen next year. And I, I don't, you know, I just, I'm not sure that. The three of you could be here on this committee, and you might not be. And I, I think it would be wise. I don't think to we learn anything from history, too. I think this is not going to pass the smell test by a lot of our constituents. Mm -hmm. You know, it says here that they want the groups to be non-political. I think this creates a lot of political divide. Okay. I mean, with you look at the, the makeup of it, the proposed makeup of it. You know, it's not very. I guess I looked at it when I read it five minutes ago, um, that this isn't, what you're suggesting wasn't quite at the level of this committee, that it's more of an advisory kind of committee for neck in the development of which, which, stuff. Yeah, mm -hmm. another committee. Yeah, and which I'm pretty opposed to. Well, I mean, that's yeah. your call, but I mean, as far as it being a part of or integrated into this level, I, I don't know that that's... Okay. I mean, they're certainly welcome to attend. It's a public meeting, but to have them as a, a point on the agenda is a, a bit higher than what I'm okay. suggesting here. And, <coughs> and maybe you can accomplish the same thing. With, we, don't we have an at-large kind of position on the planning commission? Um, I, can, I can take one of the seven seats mm -hmm. and appoint it to... But I, we're doing the appointments tonight, and I have, it was one of Fred's hot buttons when he called me about the appointment I'm making, making sure that it was a citizen. He doesn't, his, his personal take on it is wanting people that are, you know, in our community. So I can have someone who's not a citizen. I'm not suggesting overloading. I'm suggesting that maybe they, or you pick from this list, would probably be better a single appointment than they have just one seat. I don't want them to domineer, but that might be. Okay, I can probably do that in the in the future. I don't. <coughs> That's fine. I, I, I mean, and I think what you're doing right now. I'm just saying yeah. that when the opportunity avails itself, that might be one way that you can well, I, and give I them like a voice in. But it's one voice of <coughs> a group of unbiased types. Okay, I, I think that's probably a dialogue. Maybe a work study we want to. I think we maybe then we need to do a, to a work study because I've got at least one council member that I know because that because of the questions I was getting asked uh, yesterday about my um, the current appointment I'm making. Um, I would be curious to see seven or eight. Is it it's eight? It's eight. Okay. It's eight. So what's, what's the question about the current member? Just that he making sure that he that he was a citizen. Okay. Because I I have the ability. To appoint one non-resident to the committee, planning commission, and I've chose not to mm -hmm. um, to this point. I've, I've had no problem. Uh, Dave, Dr. Dave Bernstein, who lives on Geiger, um, is uh, he asked. I mean, when somebody asks to be on mm -hmm. the planning yeah. commission, you sure. and, and then they're a resident. He was on our. He's on the design review uh, committee, and uh, so. You know, I just felt he was, you know, he's serving in one capacity. Well, that committee doesn't hasn't done a lot other than here recently with this code we're developing. Um, he asked, you know, hey, when something opens up in the planning commission, I'd like to get more involved. And absolutely, well, that's kind of what I'm suggesting. Is next time something opens up, it's at least something to be considered. But yeah, I, I think that's so. I'm gonna um, we're gonna Nick and I are gonna meet with them next week and and, and hear their concerns, I guess, and. Um, 
maybe we'll bring this to to a work study in in January or February and, and talk about it with the whole council. And that's not a bad idea. Is um, well, one more comment I would make. I think that we you know value the input from from these groups, and I think we've used them very effectively the last couple of years with some of the things we're doing. They have a seat at the table. We, we reach out to them. You know, uh, they're they're a stakeholder group that when we're dealing with these types of issues, I know that the mayor, staff, council, we've we've reached out to them. I think we are. I think we do have a good relationship, and we are bouncing ideas off, and we are asking for advice. I mean, when ask them what's broken, right? <laughs> what, what, what a glaring difference between us and the county, uh, even though they're wanting to model it after what the county is, is, is just staff, the, the number of staff we have. And to create a, to, to staff and create another committee is, is going to take away from, there's a lot of work to be done here. And, and we want to get the work done and the projects out the door. And, yeah, if, and, if, and if we, you know, start, you know, we can we can have meetings that be meeting to death. Right. Yeah, it can be a real dog and pony show. We'll have as many as seven people there from staff, you know, including the director and assistant director and managers. Mm -hmm. and, yeah. So, so who are you meeting with? Wayne? I, Teresa set it up on her last okay. thing out the door. Um, it's in my calendar. I don't, I honestly don't know. We're meeting think in the chambers because it's, it's a work study so we're going to use the, utilize the table upstairs at four o'clock I think. Well with all due respect Commissioner Bauer was one that staff was from period that was how he approached everything <coughs> and uh, so I don't put a lot of credence on it because that's the way Steve wanted it. So anyway just I wasn't comfortable with what they were asking for and no. And, and I, I appreciate. I mean, I will share. This is a, these meetings are a public meeting, mm -hmm. and they're welcome to attend them. And and uh, you know maybe we just start. You know if they they can get added to the distribution list when they have their new director. And no different than their board meetings that they invite us to. We'll invite we'll invite them. Right. You know you're welcome to attend. And and We're already uh, here. We don't need another yeah. meeting and more staff time and more. Yeah. yeah. Well, and, and I, I think the one thing you haven't mentioned, too, is that when we've had special projects, we've created special committees specific to that project, and we've invited them. And yep. yeah. for the unified so code, we did that. For the architectural design guidelines, right. we did that's what that. I was speaking to. That's yeah. exactly right. Yeah. We're, I, I think we are doing a pretty good job reaching out. <clears throat> and, of course, I, it, in their eyes, it's not enough. <laughs> right. Yeah. Well, and maybe, maybe, maybe that's not it. Maybe they just have other jurisdictions. So they found maybe a broken model where this is being effective, and they're trying to deploy it, not really thinking about the individual relationship they have with the city of Fort Orchard. Yeah. And I don't think they have this going with any other city. Right. I, 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 haven't, I, haven't met, I haven't met with them. All I got was a letter from right. Teresa right. I think and then a follow-up from Teresa, and, and then I agreed to have a meeting. Yeah. So I, I think well, Nick and I will have the meeting next week. If anybody wants to attend the meeting, they're welcome to. It's at 4 o'clock next Tuesday. Um, and from there, I'll, I think I'll bring, the, bring their feedback to maybe to the work study. And, John, if you could just speak <coughs> to... Your idea is actually pretty good, and, and then we'll talk about one of those, you know, a future planning commission seat going to somebody in that interest, because we can have one, though I have an at-large <clears throat> appointment I can make that doesn't have to be a citizen, but I'd like, what I don't want to do is travel that path, and then we have a um, controversy amongst the council over my, the, the appointment I'm making, the, uh, um, so. You know, another thing is the planning commission currently is eight, and a quorum for a planning commission of eight or nine is five, and so you could you could expand the planning commission by one so that you're uh, it's a smaller percentage of the overall vote. Buy another chair. No, there's an empty chair up there. Mm -hmm. There's another chair. There's, seven. there's, yeah. se well, there's seven of you. The eight. And there's one of you makes eight. <coughs> oh yeah. No, we have eight. <laughs> we have eight. Yeah. We do have eight chairs. <laughs> yeah. So no, exactly I guess same for nine. But we'll, we'll just deal with the staff ones, but off to the side. I mean, I'm just being difficult. So the bottom line is you're going to talk to them, but we're going to punt this to the new year. I think we're going to punt it to the new year and take it to work study. Okay. And I'll, I'll bring the, the outcome of the meeting with them and their yeah. request back to the work study. But I think there's, there's some potential solutions. And, and maybe, maybe they're not interested. I mean, I'll float that idea. Would you be interested in having a seat on the planning commission? 
you know, go, it'll take a code change, but guys, you know, and, and I'll float. I think I would, I would suggest you bring them to the work study first before you float that to them. Okay. Seven. Okay. I wouldn't want to create an expectation until you've got to read with the council. So. Okay, fair enough. <coughs> yeah, find out what's what's not working in their minds. Okay. Yeah, I agree. All right. All right, thank you. All right, discussion of the 2018 Comprehensive Plan Amendments. Crawford Road. Yeah, so um, we wanted to remind the committee that uh, the Comprehensive Plan deadline for 2018 has changed as a result of the Unified Development Code. And so January 31st is our deadline for filing applications. And if the City Council or the Mayor uh, wish to uh, submit anything as a proposal, um, we would need to put together the application between now and the end of January. Um, one specific area that uh, we provided a memo, um, Doug briefed the Mayor on the Crawford Road properties off of Bethel and the uh, I think we have a code enforcement issue at uh, most of the houses on that street. And a lot of this is stemming from the fact that they are zoned commercial, but they are all residences and are non-conforming. And so nobody's putting money into maintaining their property because they have a future expectation that that house mm -hmm. is going to go away. And it's creating uh, some real headaches. And Doug, if you want to speak a little bit more to the issues out there. Yeah, and if I'm not a planner. But so I just speak from my experience um, with code enforcement and and being involved in in redevelopment and so on with with Lakewood. Um, this road is really difficult. It, the first time I turned up this road, I realized, oh boy, there here's a problem that needs to be dealt with. I felt like I had just traveled into the deep woods of uh, Appalachia or something like that. It's um, it was really bad. Uh, so what what we ended up doing was put together a team and went out there and actually went door to door and did a code enforcement effort door to door on this whole street. Uh, we've got two houses in the middle that are dilapidated, boarded up, vacant for years. Uh, we had homeless encampments on the block and the whole thing. It's a, a very, very narrow private road uh, weird ownership. There's no HOA, and it's it's parceled out to uh, to the different properties there, to where one has a, a one quarter undivided interest in the road. Others have one sixteenth interests. Um, some have no interest in the road. It's very hard to get in and out. It's also very close to Salmonberry, so it's it's at the worst part of Bethel Road as far as traffic and all of that. The ideal solution to the problems there would be commercial or uh, some sort of assembly and redevelopment. The reality is it's not going to happen, in my opinion. Uh, having been involved with these kind of things before, we have the surplus of all of this commercial land in the area that is already large parcels that don't have dilapidated buildings and all sitting on them. So here in, in this one small area, we've got uh, 14 parcels, each with a house, garage, all of this on them. So to redevelop this, someone would have to go in and assemble all of those parcels, do all the demolitions, do all the environmental and whatever cleanups when they could just go next door and buy an equally mm -hmm. large parcel that doesn't have ingress and egress <clears throat> problems, doesn't have a bad road. Uh, mm -hmm. Alternatively, if someone wanted to develop any one parcel in their commercial it's not going to happen because nobody's going to turn up that road to go to a, a business. Any one development is going to have to do road improvements and all of that that impact the entire neighborhood. Uh, ideally, the uh, the best solution, because there are also problems with the parcels fronting on Salmonberry, would be an assembly of the entire this entire intersection. But again, if you look at, at the surplus of properties and the fact, too, if there's going to be commercial development along Bethel, the way I see it, it's going to come down from Walmart and up from Fred Meyer. And this being the narrowest part, the worst traffic, 
and right in the middle is going to be the last part that ever gets goes to commercial. So it seems to me it's 20 to 30 years out before there's ever commercial development there. Meanwhile, the people with the dilapidated houses, they are no longer an allowed use. They have been sitting vacant for years, uninhabitable, so they can't rebuild those. They can't develop commercial, but they also can't rebuild those houses. They've lost their not legal non-conforming status. Uh, the vacant lots on that on that road can't develop either direction. So the city apparently did at one point offer to rezone that back to residential and at least some portion of the property owners resisted. Now most of the property owners on there are saying, oh, this is a problem. I would like to do something with my property, especially now that you're doing enforcement. Uh, there's at least one other house that, there that good chance is going to end up being torn down under enforcement as a result of this effort. And there's another one where the garage is coming down. Um, and so they're looking at it and saying, well, now what do I do? So a number of them are in favor of redeveloping or of, of proposing a comp plan amendment and a rezone to residential. But there's still at least one property owner who owns three parcels who's still saying, and he's in the worst position because he's all the way in the back, and he's still <clears> saying, oh, no, commercial is worth much more. And two, most of the owners there are very low income or they're slum landlords. So the likelihood of them, even though Roger Miner is one of the owners and he's kind of talked of spearheading, trying to get everybody together to apply for that, uh, the likelihood of them being able to do that by January and get everyone on board with it is is very low. So at that point I floated the idea of should we, as the city, take the lead and, and say this does need to be rezoned back to residential. Um, what about leaving those two parcels that front Bethel, Bethel as commercial or mixed use and then... And that, the rest of the yeah. to, uh, to, and, and that was a consideration. Are they, I thought, are they, big, are they big enough? You, know, you probably need yeah. to go all the way to 37, 45. Well, the, the, yeah. You're not going to get anything commercial. I, I think that if you change that to commercial and if only those two properties developed as commercial, then redevelopment of the entire area you know, is probably off the table for an even longer period of time. Mm -hmm. I think if commercial land starts getting consumed at some point in the future mm -hmm. and there's a demand to do something with this then we we still want to be able to change it in the future and putting it at a low density residential kind of makes things conforming for now and uh, would clean would clean so, things so you're up. suggesting low density so we don't get an apartment complex in there but we get a house that potentially 20 years from now then the house isn't an impediment to yeah. a commercial re rezoning <clears throat> in the area where if we put apartments back in there it'll be apartments forever you, and you can't put a part and that because i had considered that too that okay once again assembly and redevelopment would be the ideal solution but number one that road is so narrow you okay. i can barely get my pickup down there and turn around you can't get a fire truck down there and turned around so again you have the same problem to do any redevelopment down there you run into the same problem of the road access, the proximity to Salmonberry. Well, that would that, be improved. I mean, if, if someone came in and bought all of that, then yeah, they'd have to kind of start from scratch. Is yeah, that and that's that's the thing. That's the only real solution there is redevelopment. But but again, so yeah, I, I don't think that that thirty-four I, foot right of way. So very narrow. Is that a private road? Yes, yeah. private it's road. A, yeah. It's a road tract, and nobody knows and who owns it. No, it's it's owned. It's not. Yeah, it's, it's a fragmented ownership of yeah. the landowners in there, yeah. with some having a greater share than others. Yeah. So I think that the rezone makes sense. I'm wondering if it should, if it should go further eastward as well and <coughs> match up. Just Mm-hmm. Or the county owns Sanberry? the corner parcel. Right. Yeah. This is a county tax parcel uh, that was bought for Bethel, which we not, learned we can't use. Yeah, not northerly, but further east. Oh, yeah. So it marries up with the residential zone that's further to the east. 
That's, yeah. in, the, that's in the county. Oh, okay, so you're, you're talking adding one parcel. Yeah. He's, he's talking adding this parcel here because this so is yeah. residential. Yeah. And so so the Salmonberry parcels come to here, or the Crawford Road parcels come to here, then this one is, is commercial. And then you, get to, then you get to residential here. Right, and that's in the county. It's in the UGA, but I believe that's county. I, no, I think no, we, no, no, that's city. Uh, city too. Okay. Mm -hmm. The other alternative, yeah. you know, we've talked about there's, there not there's being there's a UGA line. Okay. Right. We've talked about there not being a lot of demand for commercial, and so seeing this, seeing the lot aggregation or somebody coming and buy this up for commercial redevelopment is a long way off. Multifamily redevelopment could be a different story if somebody, you know. Because there is a lot of demand for multifamily housing. I mean, if the goal is to see this area redeveloped sooner, um, that potentially could be a better way to do it. But you would have to involve include everything to the north up to Salmonberry, I think, to yeah to make it a worthwhile project. Does, does that make sense then? Just and go high <coughs> density residential on that and take it all the way to Salmonberry. Is that potentially it could be more palatable to those holdout? Well, I think the problem is that. You get those individual lots in there, and suddenly they want to build a fourplex on that that existing road rather than having all the properties come together. So you don't have to. Our code wouldn't allow it anyway because of the fire access. Yes, yeah, the fire access would preclude that. Um, I think that that you would almost want to create some sort of special district that requires the redevelopment of the area, not just the individual parcels. And that's not going to fix things in the short term, like changing it to single family would. Did the right. county and their plan have? Uh, a plan for a frontage road. Yeah, that was to the work. north. Um, it was going to come through roughly where Thimbleberry is and go through the Home Depot site to okay. connect with Kathy through Walmart. Um, back where they, and we've so got that in our it's corridor. It's further well. to the east from there, where we're talking. Yeah, about. there's Thimbleberry right there. Yeah, there. Just to throw in there, there are kind of similar problems with these properties mm -hmm. too, and. And my enforcement from Crawford is actually expanding to these two properties. And this one is similarly difficult because it's landlocked. Right. He's trying to bring in a new mobile home, but his driveway is through the county par property. And so he's running into problems. So, it, you know, it, it, uh, the ideal solution would be some redevelopment here because ingress and egress here with the traffic is terrible. So no matter what you do down here, this is always going to be a problem. I'm really thinking we should take all, all of it. Do, do all of it. It's 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 it. it. What Nick's alluding to, this county parcel, there's eight of these parcels along this Bethel corridor. And what we've learned, we, our position was we thought they should have came to us in the annexation. So we've recently got together with the folks at, at WashDOT uh, to have them look at how the county procured this these properties and none of them were procured properly, which doesn't wouldn't have affected the county the way that it does us because they have the county road fund. We're looking at, you know, in our corridor study, these segmented projects and going after federal money. We can't even we can't even purchase these properties from the county, and um, they're tainted in their process. So we really need them to go back, even to acquire frontage off of them, not, not even buying. Mm -hmm. So we really need these property. So we're going to be meeting, or Nick's going to reach out to Eric Baker, and then if that goes well, I'll meet with Commissioner Garrido. We're going to talk to them about rezoning these properties anyhow, and hopefully they'll end up in, if they send them back, back up in private ownership again, then we can properly procure the frontage that we need for our road improvements and then be able to federalize the project. But without this ending up back in private ownership, we're going to have to fund this road, this intersection improvement with local dollars, and that'd be pretty doggone tough to do. Um, Would we want to encourage um, high-density development or higher-density development on a, on a substandard road and an access to Bethel that we really don't want? They would have to make the improvements. What improvements? I mean, do we want to encourage more vehicles coming in and out of that area on Bethel? I guess so. Sure. Uh, 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 I think in our corridor study, we have certain assumptions for this site that include much more traffic than is there now being generated from these properties. 
And so the alternatives that we're going to be evaluating in this study assume a much higher intensity of land use throughout the corridor. But are you spot, or are you thinking that that entire corner would get developed commercially, and therefore we could have a different access maybe off the Salmonberry? I, I think the access would absolutely have to come off of Salmonberry, and that you would have to develop that that quadrant as one project. And, and that would be my concern, that if we went ahead and did a rezone that would allow redevelopment at a higher density than what's there now, we're just exacerbating the but traffic problem. When are we going to see the Bethel Cedric traffic study? Because this will get picked up in there, right? It's, it's supposed to be done around June. So the difference is we already have an intense, we're already zoned commercial. Here. Well, yeah, I understand. And so we're we're a, a, nobody's going to buy one of those parcels no. and put in a commercial. Correct. They're going to right. assemble that. Right. And at which point, when they come in with their proposal, we could require a different access. Yeah. I, I, think, I was going to say, I think what you could potentially do is change it to, you know, R4.5 mm -hmm. or R8 in the comp plan, and then designate it as some kind of master planned uh, redevelopment area <laughs> that would require the entire site to be in one ownership in order to be able to do certain things mm -hmm. as prescribed in the comp plan. But until that, until that ownership aggregation occurs, you, that wouldn't be available to you. That answers a question I was just going to ask, which was if you allow a higher density residential, would the individual properties on Crawford still be able to rebuild, you know, build yeah, new single family houses? Piecemeal development out there. That's the worst case scenario. Right. So you, wa you would want these guys to be able to, to substantially repair or rebuild single family dwellings on yes. like some standard road, but you would need a process. Yeah. To, to go beyond that, which involves compiling all those lots and creating a new access road off Salmonberry. Mm -hmm. I think that makes sense. Yeah. Yep, that makes sense. So I think what we should do then is, I would actually propose it as R4.5 because these are all large lots. We don't want further subdivision uh, to occur out in the area and, and include the properties to the north and then... Um, Provide some special designation as like a almost an overlay on the, on the map to say that this is a some kind of special redevelopment area. And when you say large policies. lots, how large are they? Mm -hmm. The ones on Crawford are small. Well, that's a large one, but the one right on Clark. That's uh, well, you know quarter acre. acre. So four point five. Well, one, that's one house, ones. right? Yeah. The, those are all. I think point one like, eight. Yeah. I think they're all. Right about point one eight, if I remember right. Oh, point one zero. That's right. Point one zero. So that that is a density that is higher than uh, probably R eight, just barely higher than R eight. But the uses are not non-conforming. It's the dimension of the lot that's non-conforming. So could those could those with the uh, Dilapidated the ones that have lost their non-conforming uses. Would they be able to build new houses on those then? Mm -hmm. Okay, they could get. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, you could go R four point five or R eight. But... So what's the to the east is it four point five? Yes. Yes, it is. We have a zoning map in here. Yes. Yeah, yeah it's four point five. <clears throat> Across the street, across Salmonberry, it's R12, but it's yeah, R4.5 to the here, city limits. At here, further east, is R4.5. Yeah. So I would suggest marrying up and going further east and even picking up um, some of those lots to the north, maybe, for Salmonberry. Maple Mar chocolate. Maple. But not the larger lots for funding on that. What's the same? What kind of process do you yeah. to get this done? By that's the that's my We just need to submit impression. the application by the end of January. So you're basically and then, just then adding that starts a six month process one parcel to the east okay. of, that makes of the property. You wouldn't process. want to have just one guy in their commercial. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, especially landlocked. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. So I guess um, it sounds like we have some direction on this in terms of bringing forward a proposal, which we can still bring to the January land use committee meeting for discussion purposes, and see if we need to tweak it, and whether that's this group or uh, a new group, we will. Uh, and then I guess take it to let, take it to work study in January as well um, to make sure the whole council has some buy-in on this. Um, and then I guess if there's any other comprehensive plan amendments that any of you can think of that might be needed, um, 
I'm happy to discuss those, or we can potentially discuss those at the January meeting if you have an idea of how something can be improved. If following up on that, I mean, we're going to talk to the county and try to get some buy-in from them right. on how they how to make their parcels marketable, right? So that we can get some change in ownership in those parcels. Um, and it might be just a matter of somebody buying it and holding it until we come along to buy it back. But um, we're, it, it's just created a, you know, we, we, you know it would be a long time out before we could do. Right. We could utilize those properties with local dollars. Yeah, I think, I think one of the ideas that we have is that if any of those properties would be of interest to the county for affordable housing in conjunction with you housing can staff, the state to do give that. those properties the appropriate That's zoning and then yeah. condition those permits on right-of-way dedications to support improvements related to that project that wouldn't be part of our overall uh, Bethel project. And if if properties, you know, probably don't have a lot of development potential, let's probably not upzone them because then we're adding to our future acquisition cost um, should we need to acquire a frontage, you know, frontage or an entire parcel for stormwater. There are two areas from the city that I... I have no idea if there's anything we can do, but Whiskey Gulch, which is right on the easterly border mm -hmm. of the city, mm -hmm. is there anything that we can do down in that area that could encourage redevelopment? <laughs> Near Annapolis, you mean? Yeah. yeah. Well, we're gonna. Um, and well, there's. I don't think it's on tonight's agenda. It could be on the ne next week's. The. Um, <clears throat> When we designed the culvert down there, the, okay, so the Annapolis Creek culvert down there, what I've, you were involved in those discussions, weren't you, Nick? There's really going to be, the problem is, is that there's three solutions, um, of an ex, very expensive, because the, the road's this way in the waterfront, and the creek's like this, and so... The, the design team is going to have to come to, th there's going to be three alternatives. One is the bridge. To do a box culvert, we're going to have to straighten it, which means <coughs> we're going to have to buy the storage unit on the one side, which storage units from a, um, in, a in an appraisal, the income approach mm -hmm. makes them very, very lucrative and expensive. Mm -hmm. The other altern the, the third option is going to be w the where um, Sam's prop where she's leasing. Um, what's that business is moving? Josephine's. In? Josephine's. Josephine's is moving to the pavilion. We could end up buying that building and demolishing that building actually to accommodate this restoration project. So um, as far as I mean, we're going to have a pathway down there, and that's why we're trying to get out in front of this box culvert, because the last thing we want to do is build this cul this pathway and come in and tear it out two or three years later to accommodate the this fish pass you know, the fish passage uh, that we have to create. So um, I know Robert owns the he's he's thinking long term there. Robert McKee, I've talked to him a couple of different times. He owns the parking lot and, and his business. Why does the box culvert have to be perpendicular? Why can't it run? Because there's force mains, uh, sewer force mains in the roadway there that are going to go through the box culvert. And right now the culvert is a two-piece culvert where it, it has one leg at a 45 degree angle and then it turns and goes out uh, to the creek. I think there's a <clears> manhole right in the middle of the road right where uh, the culvert would need to go for a straight shot. And um, I, think I think those force mains are like 36 inches? Yeah, they're... They, it's the entire sewer of the city. There's two of them in the middle in of... The way. Yeah, they're in the middle of it. And then so... The, and they have to be supported. Yeah, one of the other challenges there is that the, the elevation of the roadway there, there's not there's not a whole lot of freeboard relative to the, the flood elevation. Um, I mean, the road is really lower than what it needs to be there to accommodate the infrastructure that's going through uh, at the point where the creek is. So... It's a really challenging site. We talked about including the, the storage units as part of the mixed-use pilot program when we were exploring what properties to include, and we decided really to focus on downtown for now. But I think something similar there, where you have that pay parking lot and the storage units and seeing some redevelopment is possible. I think you have to fix, I think you have to do the trail and the box culvert before 
you go forward and see, see any redevelopment. The challenge would be is all of a sudden we created an opportunity down there, and then we ended up buying that opportunity mm -hmm. because yeah. we needed part of it for our project. So it, it was, it's a, you're right, and something needs to happen down there, but I think it's a chicken and egg thing here. We need to get our pathway you know, figured out and built down there from a design standpoint, and this culvert and, and what well, it's going to look like. Actuality is kind of an area that is drawing a bunch of people between Whiskey Gulch and the proper. I mean, it's, there's a lot of people down there. There is, and, and I think it's even with well, the pathway, it's going to be more more of, of housing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, kind of going up the canyon. I appreciate that it's a challenging area to to develop because of the topography and the creek and all those issues that are going to be there, but. Only one side of the road's in the city, though. So, yeah, it's well, all outside the city. Well, I appreciate that, but isn't the other side in the UGA? Um, yeah. Could be, yeah. Yeah, it is. Um, yeah, right, right in there. there. Arnold. It's right there. It's Arnold. Right yeah. there. Arnold. Yeah. And, you know, there's that, that uh, residential slash commercial that's right there at the corner of Bay and Arnold. It would be on what the southeast corner of that. Woody's Goodies, is that what you're talking about? I don't know if that is that what's there now, Woody's yeah. Goodies. Yeah. Right there. Yeah. yeah. There, and, you know, you look back in there and there's the potential for... Mm -hmm. You could really do high density residential yeah. on that hillside and step it down and... Yeah, mm -hmm. that's kind of what I'm thinking. It's just mm -hmm. a way to encourage, and it's right next to, you know, the pathway, it's right next to the ferry. Um, I think it's probably... I think you're right, you're, you're right, but I think it's premature. One, the area we can't really zone that yet because that's in the UGA. No, but it's. But and the other side is county. where the, um, the, the estuary is for what we're. We, I think we need to design and need to know what it is we're doing with this okay. creek. Yeah. This creek also has setback buffers that are much bigger than what is currently there, and so you're having this set development and road improvements potentially further back from. Uh, from what's there. Yeah. Can you visually go back further on Arno? Up the road? Yeah. Yeah. I think this is, is this the gravel lot here? Yes, mm -hmm. that's our parking lot. Yeah, yeah but if you... And it's terrible. Those residential there. units are on the, the right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's in the city. Yeah. Yeah, this those, is all city. I mean, if that can be encouraged for redevelopment, um, I don't know. I, that's one thought. The other thought was up around the Fort Park area. Fort Park Crosby? Well, yeah, in that general area. Like, there's a couple new homes that have been put in there recently, and there's a lot that's been emptied out. But that's kind of, to me, an area that's primed for mm -hmm. redevelopment of some form. And I don't know if there's anything that we can do that kind of encourage that with our. <coughs> So one of the things that I've been working on and looking at our, our zoning code updates, which I've started drafting, but um, uh, you know, there's other projects we're trying to wrap up first. That whole area is all part of the original rectangular grid pattern of the city. And I think that the potential there to allow for, I mean, everything's a, either 100 or 120 feet deep in terms of lot depth. But if you go into different parts of the, the area, you're seeing a lot of townhomes getting built on lots like that where you have one in front of the other and you kind of have a, a shared driveway that accesses multiple units. We really don't have zoning that allows for that or, or provides for that type of redevelopment, but I think it's going to require that level of density to to pay for what are pretty substandard roads and to, to get the frontage improvements and other improvements in that area. And so what I'd like to do is I'd like to develop a uh, a zoning district that we apply to that the historic grid of the city where you have alleys and square roads so that you're really looking at lot width and then design standards that are based on those narrow lots to make sure that you have an attractive uh, you don't have suburban houses squeezing in on skinny lots where you have you know a row of garage doors on a street I think we could probably have 25 foot lots uh, get developed but you certainly don't want garages accessing onto the street oh, in that agree. situation. But I think there's a great example of how that could be done up on Bainbridge. Uh, mm -hmm. on, uh, I can't remember if that's Madison or Winslow Way, mm -hmm. but they have a, I think it's a good example of having uh, 
a housing in a very narrow lot that basically the house, there's a series of homes that are relatively close, 25 feet from the roadway, but they're all the way at the property line on one side of the lot and the next house is all the way to the property on the next mm -hmm. and it creates a space between over here that this house was built with basically no windows looking out to that space on the neighbors mm -hmm. and it's garages on the back, there's an alley. Mm -hmm. I think we saw so, examples of that in our tour, you know, the back. Yeah, but not quite to the level, I, I think, and I don't know the numbers, but I think the, the development that they have up there has probably a higher density uh, and very narrow lots, and, and yet they're not townhomes that are just kind of right next to each other. So we're going to do a time check. It's almost 20 after 8. I've got a yeah, minute. I've got a nine o'clock. All right. Um, so if you have other ideas for comp plan amendments, I'm happy to uh, explore some things between now and the end of January. Just email me and uh, Carrie and I can look into it. Okay. It's a good conversation. Yeah. All right, 2018. Thanks, Doug. Thanks, Doug. <coughs> Thanks, Doug. Carrie, I'll let you take the lead on the housekeeping ordinance. Um, I think there's a table in your packet that talks about some proposed amendments. Uh, this large fold-out sheet. Um, since we adopted Title 20 last year... Oh, did you not get one? No, it's okay. I'll click on this. Um, since we adopted Title 20 last year, as we started getting into it, actually applying it and using it, we start noticing all those little things like, oh, we should have added this or, you know, we missed this reference or something like that. So for the last six months, we've been making a running table of everything that we'd like to, to tweak in the code, not major amendments, not substantively changing any of the uh, intent of the code language, but just picking up things that we missed or things, even updating it for things that have been changed since then. So if you look through here, there's just a number of items. Um, we have a process that's codified for how we would do this kind of amendment section, title, comment, review, or date, and action to be taken. That's all mandated by code that we put it in here like this and keep it as a public document. So I don't think there's anything that's um, going to be really controversial or will require a lot of council discussion, but you know we should take this to council at some point, hopefully in January, have them look through this and make sure there's nothing else that council would want to have added. And if you have seen anything else in the code that you think um, should be picked up at this point in this housekeeping amendment, you know, just let Nick or me know, and we'll we'll include that as well. Yeah, I think our goal is to bring this to planning commission at the February meeting, which is when hopefully they'll be done with the architectural design standards. One thing we just found yesterday too that I don't know if it is on your copy. We realized that. The architectural design standards apply to existing mobile home parks, and so we have somebody wanting to replace a mobile home at the Kitsap Housing Project, and all of a sudden we're saying, do we really want to require some of these things on a single-wide mobile home slot at the mobile home park? And I don't think that was our intent, and so we're trying to uh, now navigate that. But um, It's added to the list. It, this was just distributed before we thought of that one. Okay. Yeah. So anyway, you'll see that coming forward. Um, the other thing that... What's the timeline on that? Uh, February to the Planning Commission. Okay. So uh, we may brief council on it in January or bring it back to land use in January as well. Maybe, or maybe on the work... Maybe the work study, January yeah. work study and then go to the Planning Commission and then it can come right to the council for adoption. Sure. Does it require a public hearing? I think it will. It will at the yeah. Planning Commission. Okay, so it's going to be hearing, discussion, and recommendation in February. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, the next thing on the list, this is a really important one, is, is we've started wrapping up our architectural design standards uh, project with Makers Architecture. Um, we've started working on the process language of how we actually do design review. Our intent of uh, the project was to create an administrative process to really make it predictable and very straightforward and not a burden on uh, developers, especially because we're expanding it to all areas of the city. With that said, um, we currently have the design review board and we have a design review process, although poorly defined, that applies in the central downtown and we're trying to figure out what the role of the design review board should be going forward. Um, my initial thought was that the design review board would hear uh, requests for departures where we specifically identify areas where we want to provide opportunities to do something different consideration of those alternatives could go to the design review board as a permit type and somebody could request it. However, the as I've worked more and more on the 
the code, I'm realizing that the departures are very prescriptive, and you know, it's there's not a whole lot of discretion for how things can change, and I feel like we're trying to make the design guidelines flexible, but by creating a process where you have to go to a, a meeting and present your your issue, you're actually discouraging somebody somebody from using that process. But at the same time, we have this design review board, and although they haven't met a lot in the last few years, I'm not sure what their role should be going forward. And the easiest thing, um, which I don't necessarily recommend, would be to take the design review board out of the process and either disband it or make it an advisory uh, body that reviews design decisions of the city <coughs> and then makes recommendations for how to improve uh, the design standards moving forward and make it more of an advisory uh, board, but that takes any direct control over projects away from them. Another alternative would be to say that all projects that occur within downtown would still go to the design review board for review with compliance uh, or for compliance with the standards, but then again you're discouraging uh, potentially downtown redevelopment. Um, or you could still have the departure process go to the design review board, but to me it felt like we're trying to find something for them to do right. rather than make a user-friendly, flexible uh, set of regulations. And so I'm looking for guidance from this committee and potentially the whole council on what the role of that board should be going forward because um, we're at the point where we need to identify that. Um, our design standards, we're, we're currently looking at our existing codes for the Tremont overlay and the downtown overlay to see what code sections have to be removed so that they don't conflict with the new design standards because there's a lot of overlap between the two. And design review board and that DOD process is one of those things that we need to, to figure out here in the next uh, really two weeks because the Planning Commission is going to be having a hearing on the standards in January. So I wanted to hear your, your preferences. It's a big question. Well, yeah, I yeah, for me that's a lot to, to no. chew on right now. Um, I agree. Uh, I think for me it might be helpful to see some of that written out. Um, I think I provided the draft language that does not include the design review board in um, in one of these documents. It's, I think if you go to the section 2.78 um, which is somewhat subsection, all of it's 2.78. Yeah, hang on a second. Documents. Did we provide? Did you provide that handout that I sent to Bob or to Jeff? Yes. Which uh, I've got both of these from yesterday. Okay, this this document that you should have in front of you. Mm -hmm. Oh, Carrie, did you? I don't, I don't have it. Didn't we have a stack of those out mm -hmm. here? Okay. Yeah, this is it. That this is this. That. Yeah. If, okay. if you go to page you seven of have that. It. We only passed that out this morning, so that oh, wasn't okay. something that went out in the packet. But starting on page 7, uh, within that document, it outlines the process and basically explains that review for conformance with the design standards is to be done in conjunction with an underlying permit. And so if you apply for a building permit, the portions of the design standards that are applicable to a building are administered at that time, and we review for consistency at that time. Um, Likewise, for a site development permit, the site design standards that we've proposed apply at the time of site de development standard. There is no standalone permit for design review. You can't apply for design review except as a pre-design review where we do like a pre-application type review and tell you what, where you're hitting the mark and where you need to, to adjust things in terms of a concept plan. Um, and so right now there's no mention of a design review board in, in what's been written there. I, I have Nick ran this by me yesterday, and I just like you guys went. I don't know. I I I, I really kind of like the idea, and in really from a public perspective of having that committee, um, and having slept on it at night. I kind of like. I, I don't want impediments to projects, and if we create a a sub project process, and it makes sense, I, I don't want somebody not to apply, apply for a deviation that makes sense because there's an additional process and it discourages them. Uh, you know, um, if we've got well-defined exceptions and um, we haven't seen all of the code yet, 
but I think at a minimum, I think we want, you know, a committee that meets a couple times a year and reviews the projects and our co the design yeah. code and makes recommendations on how we can improve the process, but it's an advisory board. Well, the first thing that came to my mind is we, you know, some of the things we're doing downtown, we've got some deadlines we're working through, right? Mm hmm You know, what if we just kind of live the next five, six months you know, get feedback from that process, and then maybe it helps create clarity on how this group should or should not play a role. But we need to develop the code now yeah. for those projects, not afterwards. Yeah. Right, so that's what I'm saying. Maybe we don't have the layer yet. You know, we haven't had it before. Yeah, we, we've got a design review, in its, uh, but there's no guidelines for it. Right. For the uh, review board. For yeah, the I, review board, and it's so... And that's one of the things that folks have said is this is a subjective process and, and we've designed our project and now we go before this body that can potentially make us re re redesign our project. I, I think the other challenge with the design review board is, I mean, whether it's a committee like this or the planning commission, the amount of staff time that goes into preparing materials for that board to review and then facilitating a meeting, you know, it's, it's a, a pretty good chunk of somebody's <laughs> week. Um, just preparing for the meeting, and that's before you've taken the effort of actually educating the board on what their role is and how they fit into these new guidelines. And I think one of the things that um, happens when you don't have a board that meets regularly is they, they come into a meeting and they're not really sure how they're supposed to interact with the project application. And they, you know, I think our current practice mm -hmm. is that the design review board gets involved in, you know, paint colors and a lot of choices that really should be up to the person who is, is designing the building to propose and the design review board starts re redesigning their, their project for them. What kind of blowback would you get if you uh, dissolve the review board? Well, I, I wouldn't necessarily dissolve it. I think that the design review board is created in Chapter 2.78, I believe, and I would propose to redefine it as an advisory board that has to meet at least once a year for the purpose of reviewing the standards and the outcomes of those standards and then prov providing recommendations to the council. Like that. And that, like that. that is like a placeholder so that if we need to redefine their role in the future, the board still exists mm -hmm. and it could have a greater role if we determine that a greater role is needed, but you have at least a year to see how the sure. standards work. And I'd like to see it not just downtown. It's citywide. Yeah. Sure. So we're looking at Tremont, Bethel, Sedgwick City, right. even McCormick Woods. Yeah. You know. So a once annual. Yeah, I think effort. a once annual end of the year kind of report where they get together in November and December and projects and review what happened review. and what was good and what was bad. Um, and then you know maybe they're going to at the end of the year recommend some greater level of involvement in the review because staff didn't do an effective job. But um, or or maybe something was permitted and met code and and um, needs to be addressed and, mm -hmm. and they can identify. Yeah, or it. there's a specific material that shows up and they say, "Wow, how, how did we allow that much metal on the outside of this building?" Yeah. And we've got to you know we've got to change that standard. Yeah. Um, so I think <clears throat> delivering you know they obviously haven't met in the last three or four years at all. So we have to deliver the message that yes, we still want your input, but. Uh, the role is kind of being re redefined without their input, and I don't know how best to communicate that um, publicly, but we obviously need to adopt these standards in time for the April launch of the mixed-use pilot program. Well, I think the public message there is is we have this, this group that could be playing a role, and they're not. So mm -hmm. we're bringing definition to them to begin to engage them. Yeah. Well, I guess my only hesitation is their involvement would be pretty much after the fact. Mm -hmm. And the whole purpose, I think, and the support that we receive from the community is that we have a community watchdog mm -hmm. that would, you know, maybe we could enhance to say that they would also be kind of a dispute resolution. I mean, if you, as a department director, suggesting something, the developer can bring it to that group for you know, a second set of eyes, or you can bring something to them as a second set of eyes to look at it to make sure. Mm -hmm. I mean, you've got your, what's the 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 other dispute one, the... Departures? The, no, no, the, for the... Dogs. No, 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 the one on the, on the commercial, the, the, 
we were at. Thought building we were, Board of Appeals? Thank you. Okay. <laughs> Something along the line of the Building Board of Appeals for the design. If, if there's an impasse between the, de the developer and the Department of... Because we're, we're going to have very defined standards. And, and if there's an impasse between the two that they're... But it's still just an advisory role. They're they're right. No, I just that, that ultimately. To. So what's the what's the ultimate? If if they advise, is it? Are, we don't want. We've gone away from this. We've gone to a hearing examiner, away from the council mm -hmm. making land use decisions. So then, is ultimately then that the developer doesn't like the design review board's uh, recommendation? Does it go to the to the hearing examiner, if they it want. depends on the underlying permit type. If it's a type, if so, we're tying design review to the underlying permit, and most building permits are a type one, but some are a type two. When uh, I think once they cross a SEPA threshold or it's a, a larger scale project, then the, the appeal on a type one goes to superior court, type two goes to the hearing examiner, and then superior court. And the the nice thing about the hearing examiner hearing the appeal is they um, will typically give us kind of a, a do-over in the event that we've made a mistake and allow uh, us to go to court in the best position possible. Type 1 decisions are usually so simple that a judge should be able to figure out whether we complied with our code or did not. So who, who does the developer go to if they don't like Nick's decision? It would be that here. So they're, they're, they could, and just like, yeah. just like, I mean, the police guild or this, um, the building board of appeal, they could choose, the police guild doesn't choose to to go to, I, I haven't ever seen it, that they they could go to, there's a citizen's advisory, they, they typically go right to arbitration. So mm -hmm. we could create not only this annual review process, but I, I'm, what I'm hearing here is we could create an avenue that they could go to mm -hmm. as a check-in to this, well, I, maybe that's an overemphasis of what I was thinking. It would be more of um, a sounding board for Nick and an advisory for him that if he, yeah, this is what you're saying, I kind of think it should be over here. What do you think? And is an advisory for Nick? You could, I guess there's a couple of ways you could do it. You could create an appeals process where interpretations of the design standards go to the the design review board for a recommendation uh, prior to the entire thing moving forward to court. And so if there is a challenge related specifically to these chapters, that goes to the board before it goes to court. The other w thing that you could potentially do is if, if the developer the doesn't feel like they've got a group of lay people that don't know law or yeah. the code, they're going to they're gonna look at it That's from a touchy-feely a touchy standpoint, mm -hmm. which could make the situation worse yeah. versus better. Yeah. The alternative would be you could create an optional process where if, if the applicant doesn't feel like they're going to get what they want through administrative review, they could seek the board in, as an alternative path to that's what I was staff. Right. Yeah, that's what I was speaking to because the you, these the all these other boards that we have that's how they work. Right. The, they can choose to go that path or they can choose to go straight to the hearing examiner or court. Um, you know, and it gives them an opportunity if they think it, you know it would you know convince Nick it would, that this community group uh, is going to. See it from their perspective. It gives it gives them another avenue. Yeah. Okay. I think that would work. I mean, they, so so you make know, it the first step to eliminating the group. I mean, if we have this new process and it doesn't get used in a year, well, it will get used we'll get one, at least once, once a year, year for, because they're going to review all of the pro right, no, projects citywide. But that would get back to what we have just been talking about here. Yeah. Yeah. Just getting together once a year, as opposed to if a developer wants to go to them. Yeah, yeah. I, I think we create an optional process where they can seek the recommendation of the design review board, and it's entirely voluntary that if they think they're going to do better by presenting it, or that the board has more flexibility, you know, then we will we will give substantial weight to the recommendation of the board yeah. with regard to a project. So that well, sounds reasonable better. to me. Yeah. 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 Okay. okay. I didn't want to abolish it. At Is all. that going to no, extend in January also? No, that's going right. into the, we got to get that into the planning ground before you the just hearing. You say, well, we want to keep you, but we're only going to talk to you once a year. That's kind of like, what's a year? Short of abolishment. Yeah. It's three times 
Well, much more than what they have been in three years. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's what ADUs. I'm working on the rest of the day. All right, ADUs. I'm excited about this project. Um, we have. Uh, I've had it on my to-do list for quite some time to develop an ADU code. Currently, um, ADUs are allowed in our code. They used to be called a something else. Um, what, what, excuse me, what is ADU? ADU is an accessory building unit. It's like a mother-in-law apartment, but you can either have it... Either attached or detached. Either, yeah, uh, attached or detached. Um, and currently we don't have any... We had a bunch of footnotes in our zoning table that said, oh, one, it has to be owner-occupied, but there's not, um, there's not a whole lot of w in the way of design standards for ADUs in terms of how they're configured relative to the house. And most cities that administer ADU programs where there's an owner occupancy requirement require a recorded document on the property so that there's no question as to whether it's a duplex or a single family house with an ADU. And that's because there's typically an owner occupancy requirement for one of the two units so that you're not creating two rental units in a neighborhood. The real benefit to ADUs is that they are a great source of affordable housing and they also allow uh, ADU owners a, a potential source of income to help them uh, you know, with home ownership costs and, and whatnot. Um, the code that we've developed is largely borrowed from uh, the city of Tacoma, which I think has a, a fairly successful program. Um, we've borrowed everything from their uh, Deeds that they that are recorded for use. Uh, I think there's a there's a handful of things that have to be done. But my goal here is really to make sure that we get quality ADUs and that we make it easy for them to be created because we do have an affordability issue. And I think that we should encourage these where um, where they are appropriate. Um, there can be a commercial ADU where you have like a caretaker unit for storage units or a construction site or um, any, any number of business uses, and so some of the standards for uh, ADUs don't apply to commercial ADUs. Really, the bulk of this code is aimed at uh, single-family ADUs. And um, the other issue is that our utility policies and our ADU policies don't line up. The utility code actually refers to mother-in-law units and talks about uh, creating special rates for attached versus detached ADUs. Attached ADUs are treated as a single family home. Detached ADUs, you have to pay uh, extra money every month on your, your bill. But in reality, if you have, whether it's attached or detached, there's no difference in the impact necessarily. And there's also a likelihood that somebody may build an ADU and it may just be their man cave. It may be a place to hang out where they don't actually rent it out to somebody, yet they have to pay uh, the extra utility bill because they've chosen to have a, a second kitchen or a bar or something out in their uh, their outbuilding. So this also seeks to clean up our utility code, number one, to, to use the correct terminology, but we don't want to discourage these and by charging an extra capital facility charge and an extra monthly rate, I think you're, you're making it much harder for people to add an easy uh, source of affordable housing that currently we don't have a whole lot of people uh, constructing. So this is a very pro ADU policy to make it easier to build. The other thing that, that I've talked about, and I've sent the mayor several examples, but there's a lot of companies that make prefab accessory building units that are like a modular uh, building and they look like either a super modern uh, house or you can get a craftsman style ADU. And one of my thoughts was that we could solicit proposals from companies that build these and actually pre-approve plans so that somebody who wants to do an ADU can say, hey, the city of Fort Orchard has seven plans from a variety of companies that are pre-approved. We can go get this thing off the shelf and have somebody come pour a, a footing, and in three days they can have this, this unit set up in their backyard and have either a source of housing for a family member, a, a rental unit, or um, just creating that extra space. Well, that'd be a good idea. Fabulous. Yeah. Yeah. So my, one of my concerns is having, having not having these clash with the neighborhood or the existing home. So are there some standards so that we, they're somewhat compatible with the neighborhood. I think it's a great idea. I just want compa some compatibility. There's a requirement that they match the general style of the existing okay. house. I think part of the reason of pre part of the reason for pre-approving certain plans is because we reviewed them for consistency with the architectural style that we're seeking. And hopefully that removes barriers to push somebody to actually go out and have their own design that may look uh, less attractive or you know they might pursue some other 
uh, alternative, but there is a general requirement that they um, that they match the uh, existing structure. And they also have to be in the if it's detached, it's got to be in the backyard, so it's it's already hidden from view, and it's got to mm -hmm. have an entrance that doesn't face the street. I mean, it's there's a number of. Is there any provision that the with the automobile increase parking? So we've said that we require additional parking if on-street parking is not available on both sides of the street on which that house is located. So if there's on-street parking, I don't think we need to add ten or twenty thousand dollars to the cost of the project. But if there isn't on-street parking, we require one space. So you ha we're allowing these for commercial and industrial developments. Yep. Um, but if there is one-story developments, they couldn't do it. Yeah, I think it, it's. Um, yeah, on page three. Um, shall we locate it on or above the second floor of the building which it's located? That's referring to an attached uh, ADU. I think we added the... Carrie attached. pointed out that we allow for commercial ADUs and that what I had written was almost entirely for single family. And this was a footnote that's already in our code, if I'm not mistaken. Yes. And so we were just keeping the language consistent. But perhaps I should say that in commercial or industrial developments, when an ADU is proposed, it shall be attached uh, and located in this area, or if we want to allow detached, maybe the standard only applies to attached. Well, it does say detached ADUs are not allowed. Okay, yeah. And it, the ADU should be on or above the second floor of the building which it's located. Right. And so the one example that comes to mind is storage units. Mm -hmm. We want a caretaker on site, but those aren't two-story developments typically. Uh, we've actually, actually had one have, proposed yeah. that had a second floor apartment above the office. One of my okay. hill is. Yeah. Yeah. It's yeah. That's pretty common now because usually they are coming in at two or more floors and often they do have a caretaker okay. built in from the beginning. Yeah, Yeah. I, I'm not wedded to that. I think that we just took our existing provision okay. and carried it forward because we weren't writing this to address commercial ADUs. Okay. All right. So I'm, uh, I just wanted to make sure that this committee was comfortable sending this, this straight to the Planning Commission. For, um, I really like the idea about having pre-approved pre -approved plans. Yeah. I think that would be Yeah, and I, awesome. can, I, I, I sent some examples to the mayor. I'd be happy to share those with you if you're interested in seeing what's, what's out there. I, I think when you bring it to work study, you should bring those examples mm -hmm. for yep. ASC. And I think this is a tool for particular... Forest Park, where we've got those long lots, and they could put that ADU that accesses from the alley. Um, mm -hmm. You know, this isn't probably something that's going to. You know, I'm sure there's covenances in McCormick Woods that would outlaw this. Yeah. So, well, yeah. But, the, but in other areas of the city, this is probably the. There are some tool. units that have ADUs. Yeah. yeah they, the there McCormick are. community said that they were totally supportive of allowing these. There already have some. Do they? Development. Yeah. Cool. In okay, McCormick cool. proper. Uh huh. Oh wow. Absolutely. I'm surprised. Exciting. I mean, gosh, you guys have to get approval for a pink color. Yeah. <laughs> no tree houses. <laughs> so is this a it's hearing? not that restricted. So this will go to the Planning Commission for introduction in January and a hearing in February. Who painted bright pink? It's like a letter. No basketball hoops on the street. Are we adjourned? About that. Yeah, we're adjourned. All right.